Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, tuning in today. Uh, today we have a, a pretty good program. It's going to be really interesting. It's going to be about the glass traditions and the glass history of Southern New Jersey. And uh, with us today, we have uh, Kristen Quills, who is with uh, the Museum of American Glass at Wheaton Arts. And uh, she's going to take us through and talk to us about the uh, traditions uh, of the past and what's going on today in uh, glass um, you know, making in Southern New Jersey. And with that, I'll turn it over to Christian. Great, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for inviting me to um, talk with you all about uh, the South Jersey glass tradition. Um, the South Jersey glass tradition uh, began in the colonial era. And by the 1860s, uh, the glass industry was well established in New Jersey, um, utilizing the abundant natural resources of the state and by the 1880s, the number of factories melting their own glass steadily grew to over 65. Um, the majority of these plants were down in the southern part of the state um, and mainly manufactured window and bottle glass. Only a handful of these glass uh, places produced tableware, um, but they also did a lot of cutting due to the popularity of cut glass in the 19, uh, early 1900s. Um, now, nearly every one of these factories gave their glass workers the ability to make their own wares at the end of day when their quota was complete. So many South Jersey glass blowers became legendary um, for the glass they produced in their own time. The automatic glass blowing machine was invented in 1903. And that meant the industry began to change. Really by the 1920s, the majority of factories in South Jersey had gone fully automated. Um, smaller plants that couldn't compete with those plants that had the machine closed, um, while others merged into larger companies. This meant the opportunities for glass workers to make their own glass virtually disappeared. But by the 1930s and 40s, several smaller factories um, or larger factories created hand shops where they could produce the hand blown glass and keep those traditional glass blowing skills alive. Individual, individual glass makers built backyard shops where they could create their own glass. Others banded together and formed clubs um, where they could blow glass on the weekends. So all together at one point, there were over 225 glass factories that operated in the state of New Jersey, more than any other state in the nation. Today, um, there aren't nearly so many. However, the tradition of creating personal items out of glass is still very much alive. Uh, carried on by the contemporary studio artists that utilize the medium to create their fine art. But this all started in 1739 with a German immigrant named Caspar Wistar. So why are we in South Jersey? Caspar Wistar was from an area in uh, German Germany known as um, the Baden-Württemberg Pardon my bad German pronunciations there. Um, it's in the Black Forest area, which is on the border of, of France and, and Switzerland. Um, this is an area where the German glass technique came from. And so Caspar Wistar was uh, very used to what the natural resources were that, that helped make glass happen. So you can see on the slide, um, the image in the middle is an image from that area in Germany, while the image on the left is an image of a similar area down here in South Jersey in Millville called uh, Monantico Ponds at this point. It was a, a sand quarry. Um, so Wistar, um, riding through South Jersey on his way to the shore, as many Philadelphians do, um, actually recognized this natural resource and decided to start a glass house here. Um, it was in Alloway, New Jersey, which is in Salem County. It started in 1739, and he was able to do so because he was German, and he brought over German glass blowers, uh, defying the English policy forbidding all manufacturing in the colonies. Um, the English glass blowers could not come over, so that's why we had the Germans. Um, also, Casper Wistar was neighbors with Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin's son was the um, governor of New Jersey and had some sway with the crown. And so he was able to um, keep up his glass house down here and establish the first successful American glass manufactory um, again in 1739. 
Now, sand is the main ingredient in glass. You can see here uh, a mining, a sand mining um, company from Cumberland County. Um, the green tint in this early glass that you see coming out of South Jersey is because of the iron that is in the local sand. Um, so you see on the top of the slide, these two bowls or milk pans, you can see that green tint. We also had an artist, uh, Chris Wolston, who worked in our studio and was inspired by this natural green of the South Jersey glass. And he created this piece, his whimsy, um, which he wanted specifically to recreate that South Jersey green. Now, another key ingredient in glass is um, the fires to keep those furnaces burning. Um, glass melts at around uh, 2,350 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see here is an ad for Glassworks for sale in Port Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, it was printed in the Aurora and uh, Philadelphia newspaper in 1815. And so you can see the very first thing, 140 acres of the finest quality young timber hand within a mile of Port Elizabeth landing. So this meant that there was a lot of lumber for the furnaces. And you can see, we also would use the, um, the wood to create tools. At the bottom, you say Bob Brochart, who is a craftsman in wood turning, and he creates the tools that you can see our studio manager, Skitch Mannion, using in the upper image. There's a great quote from a local historian, Ray Horner, who says, good woodcutters were a great asset to any glass company, and there are some good ones in South Jersey. Sometimes two glass houses would own adjacent woodland and arguments would arise over the boundary lines. These arguments were usually verbal since each man had an ax in his hand. The wood was also used to make potash, which is another ingredient in glass. And the final ingredient was lime. Um, Potash was a flux that would bring down that melting temperature of the silica sand and the lime would stabilize the glass. So because we're near the Delaware Bay, which the, where there are a lot of oysters, they're able to take the oyster shells um, and source lime from them. Being near the waterways was also key for these early glass houses. Um, for those of you who might have traveled between uh, Philadelphia and South Jersey, um, even today, sometimes the roads lead a little something to desire. So you can imagine um, what it might've been like trying to transport glass goods over um, early roads. So the waterways gave a smooth sailing so that the um, materials that were made could then be shipped to Philadelphia, New York, Boston to be sold. You see here um, a map of South Jersey that shows where the glass houses are, as well as you can see waterways and railways that connects all of them. This image of the Quinton Glass Company, you can see it's right up on the edge of the waterway with the boats right there by the packing and shipping house to um, pick up the material to ship to market. And you see uh, an ad for a window glass company. Um, now this glass was made in South Jersey, but you can see that um, it lists that it would have been sold elsewhere in, in New York and Boston. Now, another key factor to the success of these companies was the clay used to make the pots. So the pots are what held the glass inside the furnace. Um, today, we use state-of-the-art ceramic technology or refractory brick. Um, and you can see an image of that on the far right. That is our furnace in the Wheaton Arts Glass Studio. And you can see in the center, an image of Don Friel um, gathering glass from our furnace. Um, but on the left, you can see the New Jersey Clay Pot Company in Vineland. And what they're doing is making um, what are known as monkey pots, partially because you can kind of see the face um, on these pots and they were made out of um, clay. And those are what were put inside the furnace to melt the glass in. Now, it was often that these pots would break. So um, you see here in this article from the West Jersey Press, from 1879, um, both the glass factories at Quinton have stopped for the season. In one house, a run of 10 months was accomplished without the loss of a single pot 
something which it is asserted has never been done in the United States before in the annals of glass making. Okay, so what was made in these various companies? In large part, window glass. It was in great demand in the 18th and 19th century, um, especially as America was growing as a country and we were doing a lot of building. Um, there are two different main processes by which you could make window glass at this time. Um, there is the English crown or bullseye method. You can see that in figure 11 in the center of the screen. This is where um, the glass blower would create a bowl at the end of the blow pipe and then using centrifugal force would spin it out into a flat disc. That disc would then be cut into panes. But as you can see in the image on the upper right, um, those panes would have pontils or bull's eyes in the center. Um, oh, so this, this method wasn't overly um, efficient because you have a lot of rounded edges. Now, on the other hand, the more common German method, which is what you would have seen down in South Jersey, largely because um, our glass houses were, were started with German glass blowers is the cylinder abroad method. You can see that um, an, an example of that on the left. Um, what happened is you would blow a very large cylinder. The glass hazard would um, you know, have large troughs in which the glass blower could lengthen and stretch a large bubble. You would create a cylinder. Um, you would score it down the length of that cylinder and then slump it open. So you would have a large rectangular square of glass that then you could cut into pieces and none of those pieces would have a bullseye. We also made a lot of hollowware or bottles. All types of bottles were in great demand in the late 18th and early 19th centuries and were needed to hold, you know, all sorts of liquids, foodstuffs, um, what have you. Dr doctors, druggists, tavern keepers, brewers, housewives, everyone required bottles. Um, so the early grass factories uh, produced a wide variety. Indeed, bottles were probably one of the first objects to be made out of glass more than 2000 years ago. Um, so really, again, this would be the more co most common method for the American uh, colonists to store their food. Um, and then as we became our own country, um, it was preferred over pottery because it was transparent, so you could see what was inside, and it was preferred over metal or, or some sort of cloth or textile because it didn't react to the liquids or foods inside. Um, the earliest bottles were dark green liquor bottles made in Europe, um, but then, so the American glass factory started copying these bottles, um, but eventually we developed new forms and new colors. Um, there are flasks, colognes, figure bottles uh, developed with the improvements of technology and of metal molds that were carved with decorative designs, um, political figures, and into unusual shapes. Before paper labeling and back when literacy wasn't necessarily as common as it is now, um, oftentimes the shapes or design on these bottles would indicate what was inside. Um, so that way these things became recognizable. So a mustard jar was different than a soda bottle or a flask was different than a medicine bottle. So you can see here some images of different um, bottles. On the upper left is a, a food jar from Wisterberg. So again, that would be a very early piece. You can see it's a little wonky, we'll say. It might not pass today's quality control, but at that time it was a complete vessel that would hold um, your food. So it was, it worked out very well. Um, also the mason jar was invented in South Jersey. So um, you see a couple early mason jars there. Um, so again, you can see here how bottles developed um, from vest, very crude vessels into um, items that are shaped like fish or corn. Um, so again, this was a very popular um, item made in South Jersey. Now I mentioned before that the rich cut glass became very popular in um, the late 1800s, early 1900s. So there were a lot of cutting houses in New Jersey, especially in Hamilton and, and Egg Harbor. Um, 
we didn't necessarily make the blanks, which is the original um, shape or form that was used to then be cut into. They were imported, but we did do a lot of the cutting here. Um, so you can see on the upper right, that is Charles Link, who was a cutter that worked in Bridgeton. And you can see him at the wheel um, cutting into a rather large vase. Um, you can see a cutting shop down in the lower right corner where you have the leather belts that are again turning these wheels. Um, in the upper center, you see an example of how those cuts would have been made. They would have started with the larger cuts and using gravity to help pull the bull down over those wheels and then make smaller and smaller cuts until they dip it in an acid bath to make it shine. On the upper left-hand corner, you can see Gay LeClaire Taylor, um, former curator and director of the museum, talking with a worker from the Liberty Cut Glass Company who's reviewing um, how cutting worked. This type of glass fell out of fashion um, as uh, World War I, the depression hit and people didn't have the money to spend on fancy glassware. So how did you learn to become a glass blower? Um, oftentimes you would be indentured as a younger child. You can see here an indenture paper on the left. Um, that would mean your parents would sign you over to work in the glass factory. On the upper right, you can see an image um, of how young some of the people were who were working in the glass factory. So you would start doing small jobs, bringing in tools and molds, carrying the finished product to the lair. Um, and then hopefully over time, you could move up and train into being a gaffer or the lead glass blower. Um, due to concerns about schooling, um, they developed night schools and other ways to make sure that these kids um, did get school. So you can see here a certificate of schooling to ensure that the worker was actually being educated. Another key aspect of these glass factories in South Jersey um, were the fact that um, you know, at the time, a, a town would almost develop around the glass factory, a fairly uh, self-sufficient town there. And the company would run the company store where they would bring in goods that the um, workers would need. And so the company would pay in what's known as scrip. Um, you see an example of some from the Salem Glassworks pictured there. Um, and so that was company money that you could really only spend in the company store. You see a ledger um, from a Waddell Tatum uh, employee up in the upper right. Um, now, part of this makes sense. The United States didn't have stable currency until right around the Civil War. Um, so to a certain extent, it made sense to issue uh, money that was good for um, goods in the store. But eventually, um, you know, that fell out of favor as we were able to move a more ably between towns and your script from your company town didn't work in the next company town. And so um, these workers uh, went on strike to be paid regular money. Um, and so largely this practice was abandoned right around the Civil War. So we can thank glass blowers um, of the past for us being able to be paid um, in federal dollars. Now, as I mentioned, um, the automatic glass machine um, really changed how glass houses work. Um, really by 1914, um, there are 172 of these machines in operation, each one capable of producing 40 bottles a minute or 75,600 per day. Whereas in the 1880s, it took a shop of three men and three boys to produce approximately um, 1,500 bottles a day. So you can see this is a big change. Um, on the left, you see what it would look like in a glass house to have um, the group of a team of glass blowers working on creating these bottles. And on the right, you can see the IS bottle machine. Um, so what this really means is we don't need that hand skill anymore um, to create glass uh, bottles and vessels. What we need is a mechanical skill to run the machines. Additionally, um, glass fell into some decline, um, especially after World War II. Um, other areas of the country um, developed uh, glass um, you know, factories, especially the Ohio Valley, became especially well known for creating glass in the um, late 1800s. And um, so they developed a stronghold. Um, other materials came about to, um, you know, to, for beverages, um, for example, uh, plastic or aluminum cans. 
Um, and oftentimes these were lighter to ship than glass. So um, that encouraged a shift um, to non-breakable and lighter materials. Um, globalization caused glass and uh, labor to move to other parts of the world. Um, so really what happened is the, the glass in South Jersey, um, again, fell into a level of decline. There's still glass down in South Jersey. Um, Durand, part of ARC International, still um, creates a lot of tableware, um, Pyrex dishes, um, and there's also scientific wear that happens a lot in South Jersey, where again, right now, given uh, the situation with the COVID virus, they're definitely working um, to maintain those glass vials that are needed to do the scientific experiments. Now, as I mentioned, um, in the factories, uh, the glass blowers are always allowed to make their own wear, known as whimsies. So what you have here is um, a sort of a melting pot of workers that came from other areas, uh, especially Germans, um, Swedes, Czechoslovakians, French, English um, glass blowers who brought their own glass making traditions and were able to show off in their um, individual items. So here you see um, uh, four glass blowers from the Waddell Tatum Company who are holding up batons that they have made. Um, these batons were used, this is after a Labor Day parade, back when we used to um, have Labor Day parades. And the glass blowers would make these batons that are um, take a lot of skill to create, um, to show off who they were, that they were the glass blowers. They would also make items like toys for their kids, um, these lovely lily vases to, um, you know, give away as gifts, as well as show off their skills. This is a 16 part decanter you see in the lower right that was created by John Rulander. Um, so again, that's 16 separate compartments in one container. Now, as I mentioned before, there are backyard shops and other hand shops that maintained this hand skill. Um, the Clevenger brothers, um, were known, they opened their shop in 1931, and you can see they were known for um, creating replicas of colonial wear. Now, some might say that they were trying to game the market um, to sell their goods as um, authentic antiques. That is not the case. They really were just interested in maintaining um, this hand skill, and they never tried to pull these off. That would be more um, unscrupulous antique dealers. Whereas the Clevenger brothers, again, and you can see a picture of them working in the bottom left, that's Reno and, and Allie. Um, they were interested in, again, maintaining these hand skills that they saw were disappearing because the companies were going all mechanical and automatic. You also have on uh, the lower left, Matt Farabella, who worked at the Italian club. Again, this was a club of um, glass blowers who got together and pooled their money to buy the gas, buy the materials to um, put in the furnace and would spend all weekend um, blowing glass. And so um, it's really through these um, backyard shops and small hand shops that maintained this tradition of handmade glass. Now today, um, as I mentioned, there are artists who um, contemporary artists who use the medium of glass. At the Wheaton Arts uh, Glass Studio, we have codified that relationship with artists using the medium through a fellowship program. On the lower left side, you see um, an image of the first set of fellows we had come in in 1983. On the upper right, you see Dale Chihuly with the eye patch and his team, I believe that was 92. Um, when he was there. So over time, we have um, invited artists to come in. And again, they hand make with glass um, using the same tools and have kept that handmade glass tradition alive. Now, Wheaton Arts, um, again, over time, we've shifted um, to really embrace having artists at the center, understanding that by working with the artists in the studio, we're able to preserve the intangible aspects of this hand-blown glass tradition. So at the Museum of American Glass, we continue to have displays of both historic and contemporary glass, um, as well as one programs. Um, you know, some hopefully someday soon we'll be able to have groups back in the museum. Um, right now we are open on a limited basis on Saturday and Sundays. Um, so please do um, come down if you're able. 
We also have our glass studio, which you can see imaged here. Unfortunately, that is not open to the public right now. Um, glass blowing is not something you can safely do without a mask. Um, so for the safety of our um, artists, as well as the public, um, the, the studio is currently running on a limited basis um, and it's not open. But here you can see um, some of the demonstrations and some of the artists who have worked in our studio and we're looking forward to getting them back in soon. But our um, Skitch Mannion, who is manager, did shoot this video of how he makes a lily pad pitcher. So I'm going to narrate this video for you to give you a little sense of how um, this glass was made by hand. So what we're seeing here are lily pad pitchers from the museum collection. This is a patterning that harkens back to more of a German technique with glass. Um, you can see that there's a, a pitcher, there's a thick overlay um, of, of a design pulled up on it. Those are known as the lily pads. Um, you can see they're usually in that sort of greenish color because of that original sand. There's a threading on the lip. I've heard it said that that helps prevent drips. Um, again, an apply, hand applied handle um, and applied foot at the bottom. So this is what, again, these would be early lily pads. Here we have uh, sketches showing us his bench. So a bench is where the gaffer or lead glass blower sits. He has his tool set out. Um, Skitch likes to have tools on both sides of him at the bench. So this is showing his specific tool set. These are the tools he'll be using to create the lily pad pitcher. Here are the blow pipes. Um, again, not very uh, useful with a mask, um, but these pipes need to be kept at a certain temperature. So a lot about glass blowing is all about the temperature. Um, so if the pipe is too cold, um, the glass uh, won't stick. If the pipe is too hot, the glass will stick too much. Here Skitch is demonstrating the color green he is going to be using today. Um, this is made, this is not from the natural iron in the glass. It was uh, a metal oxide was added to get that color. Here he is dipping into our furnace. So he's gathering um, a gob of glass at the end of the pipe. You can see the glass is glowing hot. So again, that furnace is running at 2,350 degrees Fahrenheit. He's pouring water over that pipe to cool it down. Um, although I can attest that glass blowers um, are very used to the heat um, and don't seem to be bothered by it at all. So if, if you like the heat, maybe look into glass blowing. So he's gonna sit down here and pull out a block. This is one of those wooden tools. And what he's doing here is he's shaping the gather, as well as cooling the outside so it creates a skin on the outside um, while the inside is still very molten. So he's gonna blow into the pipe there. And as, his, as the air moves up the pipe, you're gonna see how that gather expands. So you see there, he's blown a bubble into that gather. He's gonna blow some more. So the slightly cooler skin on the outside is holding the shape while the glass on the inside is expanding out. Again, you can see that it remains hot. Now, a lot of glass blowing is, again, you see he keeps turning. So it's kind of like honey. If you stop turning, it's just gonna fall off the pipe. So the entire time you're gonna notice that he's gonna keep turning. So what he's doing here is he's letting it set up. So he's letting the glass get to the right temperature where it's gonna be able to hold that bubble and not collapse. Um, but he'll still be able to work with it and create the shape he needs to. So again, a lot of glass is about temperature. And you can see, even though this glass will end up like that green color that you saw earlier, it's glowing red because of the heat. So you see, it's gotten a little darker, it's cooler. This means he can add a second gather. So for the shape and the size of the piece he's making, he needs more than one gather of glass. So that's what he's doing here is he's adding more glass onto the bubble that he's already created so that he has enough material out of which to create um, the pitcher shape um, for the lily pad pitcher. Again, he's cooling off the pipe and you can see the steam coming out of it. He's moving back to his bench. Eric, his assistant is giving him a larger block and Skitch is doing the same thing here. He's shaping the, the gob at the end of the pipe. And he's also slightly cooling that skin on the outside to create a tension so it can hold a shape while he expands that bubble. 
that has been reheated. We don't want to keep showing you the reheating all the time, but that happens often. So here you can see, um, again, we're just continuing to perfect that shape. Skitch is using gravity here. He knows the pitcher is going to have kind of a bulbous bottom. So you can see how that um, the bubble kind of rounded out as he held the pipe up. And as he moves to um, the reheating chamber, you can see again how he's moving that pipe up and down to let gravity help him um, create the shape and form he wants. Here he's using a marver, which is uh, doing a similar thing as the block, which is cooling the outside of that, that gob and helping create the shape he wants. So you can see every time he works with the material, he's slowly but surely getting it closer to the shape he's aiming for at the end. I found um, as, as a non-glass blower, sometimes watching them blow glass, it can be hard to tell what exactly it is they're doing and how what they're doing at this moment is gonna end up being the final product. Um, but each step here, he's thinking 10 steps ahead. So he's setting this up um, for what the final product would look like. So for example, here he's pulling a neck. So he knows that the final piece is gonna have a bulbous bottom and then a neck up top. So what he's doing is creating sort of the outline of that shape as you can see here. And then he's constricting right near um, the end of the pipe, what we call the moil, um, so that eventually he can break the piece off because eventually we'll have to come off the pipe and when that happens, then he can open the neck and create the, the pitcher form um, with the spout. So again, here he is using gravity by leaning it down a little bit so that the um, glass will pull and lengthen um, to help create the, the, um, the pattern that he's looking for, the shape that he's looking for. And again, it's a lot of um, waiting for the temperature to be just right. Now, someone like Skitch that you're looking at here, he's been blowing glass since he was 10. So he has incredible experience and he just knows. Um, he knows by looking at, you see how he looked closely at it there? So he knows by looking at the color, he knows by how it feels at the end of the pipe when the glass is ready for um, the next stage. So again, it's a lot of practice. Um, it's a lot of knowledge about how the material is going to work. So you see here, Eric, his assistant, has um, got another gob of glass. Um, and Skitch is going to turn the piece upside down and attach this gob at the top of what is going to be, or actually it's the bottom of what's going to be the pitcher. So he sheared that off there. Those are diamond shears that have a, a diamond shape in the center. Um, because so you can kind of cut it. Otherwise, if you use straight shears, it's going to um, stretch the glass out. Um, so what this is going to become is that lily pad decoration. So he's got this thick gob of glass and he's gonna take his tweezers and pull it up while it's really hot and place it over what's going to be the body of the pitcher. So you see this and he's gonna sort of press them down. Um, so this is how you're creating that thick overlay with a, a, a heavy gob of glass that goes on and then creates that thick um, patterning on it that is known as the lily pad. And again, the heating, the reheating, making sure everything is the right temperature. If it's not the right temperature, um, if you add glass that's too hot and glass that's too cold, it's gonna break. If you add glass that's too hot and glass that's too hot, it's just gonna melt in. Um, so it's a level of trying to maintain, again, that perfect temperature that allows you to keep the shape that you've created, keep the pattern you've created, uh, but let the glass, the material be workable um, so you can expand it into the pattern. So here you can see he's got that really hot. Um, we're making sure that that pattern is still there. Eric's gonna help um, inflate the bubble a little bit while Skitch um, flattens out the bottom and makes sure that that um, lily pad decoration um, is incorporated into the body of the pitcher. So you can see the bubble slightly expanding as Eric is blowing into the blowpipe and Skitch keeps turning it again so it maintains on center um, and doesn't start to droop or, or dip down. So you can see how what started as what looked like a, a chunk of glass um, barely blopped onto the end of a pitcher has now become an integral part of that piece and part of that decoration of that lily pad. Okay, again, Eric is getting um, another small gob of glass here. And um, I'm pretty sure what he's gonna do is punty 
um, the end of the piece. No, I bet he's adding a foot. I'm sorry. I bet he's adding a foot here. Um, so again, we manage the temperature. So while Eric's waiting for his gob of glass to cool down a little bit, Skitch is getting his glass to the right temperature to be able to accept another piece. Sometimes with the way the um, glory hole or reheating chamber works, you want to, uh, you get the bottom half a little hot. Um, so you wanna make sure that neck remains hot enough that it doesn't start to uh, crack off. So he's using a torch here to apply some direct heat where he needs it. Um, now he's again, continuing to spin. So we're trying to get everything at that exact right temperature where you can add the additional bit of glass to create a foot. So again, here comes Eric with that gob. Skitch turning the pitcher um, up so that Eric can add a gob. And similar to before where they added the piece to create the lily pad design, this is gonna become the foot so you can see again, Skitch shearing that off with the shears going back into the glory hole to make sure that it is heated properly so that he can continue to manipulate the material. And then he's gonna come back to his bench to um, continue to shape it. So since this is the foot, what we're gonna need to do is flatten it out a little bit. So you can see here he's using the back of his jacks, which are um, a fairy key glass tool to flatten it out. Now he's got Eric running a wooden paddle along the bottom while Skitch um, cuts in um, the indentation between the bottom of the pitcher and that foot. And again, you can see the difference in temperature here between that foot that's hotter and that pitcher that's um, colder. It still glows a little red and is not exactly that, that green color that you saw earlier again, because it's retaining that heat. But you can see that foot cooling down a little bit and Skitch has got his jacks there that he's using. He's rubbing those jacks on um, beeswax there um, to help prevent tool marks um, along the, the glass piece as he's using it. So again, we are um, rotating, continuing to rotate the glass so that it doesn't start to slump so that uh, that centripetal force can flatten out that foot a little bit. Now we're punting. So this is where a very small sort of dab of glass is attached in the exact center of the bottom of the piece so that we can break off the pitcher and work on the neck. We have the bottom of the pitcher with the foot and the bulbous body um, completed. And so now we need to open the neck. So Skitch is breaking off right there where he's where he cinched in before. So that's where he can crack off the piece Eric takes it on the punty and moves it over into the reheating chamber. Um, so again, we can start to heat it up. So as you can see, now we can heat the neck up. And this means that Skitch can work on shaping the neck and pulling that spout out um, to create the pitcher form. Our, um, we use natural gas in our studio um, to heat the glory holes and the furnaces. And we use electric annealers or, or kilns. So at the end of this process, you will see this glass, because it's so hot right now, um, you can't just uh, break it off and say, okay, we're done, um, because then it will shatter. You have to cool it down very slowly. So at the end of the process, you'll see them putting it in a large oven, basically, that um, takes it from uh, about the 1500 degrees that it is right now down, uh, holds it about 900 and then um, becomes touchable. Here he's shearing off a little bit of extra at the top. So where it was kind of bunched together for when it was connected to the blowpipe. So he sort of pinched out some of that extra glass and has cut it off to make a more um, even uh, top lip to the pitcher. And again, heat it up. So a lot of back and forth between the bench and the glory hole to maintain that temperature. So now you can see that that neck is nice and hot. So Skitch is gonna put his jacks inside there and now he's gonna pull the neck out. So see how he's kind of leaning the jacks out while he moves, rotates that pipe and pulls that neck out. Now Eric's gonna bring another gob of glass and this is gonna be the threading. So we're gonna pull a little bit there. So you get nice and drippy attach it 
And then while it's um, turning on the pipe there, you're going to add that threading. Again, heat it up nicely so um, you can really work with the material. Skitch is going to put his jacks bet back in that neck and start to pull it out a little bit. So see how he's bending those jacks out and it expands that neck. Now he's adding that spout. So one thing here is he knows that he's going to have to add a handle to this. So part of what's happening in Skitch's brain is that um, he's again thinking 10 steps ahead. So he knows he's got to place a handle. So where is he going to put the spout? Because the handle has to be opposite. And he wants to make sure the handle lands someplace where it's going to make sense for him to attach it. So here Eric is creating um, you know, another gob of glass. He's getting to get ready to attach the handle to the piece. So. Um, Skitch is doing a little trick. I think he learned from uh, Don Friel where he adds a small bit of chalk so that he can line up the handle perfectly across from that spout. Eric's getting a little more glass because the handle's going to take more than one gob of glass. Again, cooling down the pipe. So here we just have a two person team in part because of COVID and we're limiting the number of people that can be in our studio. Um, but glass blowing is is a team sport, so to speak. Um, you do um, need to work with others. Um, so Eric here is assisting Skitch. Um, he's a recent college grad, and so um, he is learning a lot from Skitch by being able to assist him in creating these pieces. And uh, Skitch is the gaffer or lead glass blower. Um, so now you see he's going to bring up the gob to be attached for the handle. So Skitch is going to line up the pitcher place the glass, pull up the glass to get a nice handle shape. Let it cool a little bit so it can hold that shape. Shear it off. Now again, this is a, a this is tricky. You gotta like turn turn the piece while you're pulling the handle and attaching the handle. So you see here he pulled the piece, looped it back and attached the bottom of the handle um, to the finished piece. Now he's using gravity to help shape that handle. And here he's using another tool again to help get a really nice curve within that handle. Make sure it's straight and even. Again, applying heat in the places that's necessary to make sure that the entire piece maintains an even heating um, and doesn't break off. continuing to turn it so that it maintains its shape. Now here, Eric's wearing um, gloves. Skitch is going to crack it off. He's applying water to that point where it's attached. So that's gonna cause tension in the glass. And when he hits the pipe with that piece of wood, it pops off. Now, Eric, who's wearing the insulated gloves, brings it over to the annealer where he puts it in to, um, again, slowly cool down over time. Um, I'm not sure, I think a piece like that might be a day or two in the annealer before it comes out. So that's how um, you make glass um, by hand, a little brief um, introduction there. Hopefully um, COVID will go away and you'll be able to come see that in person in our studio. So I hope what you've seen today shows that um, no matter what the output, whether it's lily pad pitchers, um, vessels and bottles or contemporary art, um, the tradition, the South Jersey glass tradition continues um, with people using this material um, both for functional and for fine arts wear. If you would like to contact me um, with further questions, please feel free. Here is my email. Also, please visit the wheatonarts.org website for more information about um, further virtual events we may be hosting our current opening schedule, and if you um, are interested in ways to support us. We also have um, an online shopping um, as well as in-person shopping. So um, with the holidays coming up, that's a great, great way to um, help continue and preserve this South Jersey glass tradition. And I believe now we will be opening up uh, to questions. All right, uh, Kristen, thank you very much. Uh, ben, that was amazing. I really uh, appreciate the history and the why and where, that was fantastic. But I was just blown away by the thought process 
uh, the dexterity the glass maker must have to be able to do all those things at the same time, work in concert with somebody else. I mean, I was watching his left hand doing something, his fingers moving the the the, the ball. It was fantastic, and yep. uh, what what a truly uh, art it is uh, to make it. I just that's really neat. Absolutely. Um, man, and the experience to to know. I mean, like you're saying. You'd have to just know it's not something you're going to be able to explain or tell somebody. Uh, that was neat to have you narrate it because I was thinking there's no way you could actually do that and explain what you're doing at the same time. So uh, really, <laughs> Although, really cool. When, when we are open, they do manage to do that when they're narrating. Um, but that's, again, like I said, Skitch has been blowing glass since he was 10. Um, you know, he's worked in both artist studios and production studios. Um, so he is well versed um, with this material and he really enjoys um, both exploring historic techniques as well as working with contemporary artists to really see um, what we can do with the material and push it in whole new, whole new ways. So it is very exciting to have that studio on site right behind the museum. You know, it's really cool to see the tools too. I mean, I've seen a lot of those tools lying around in different places and didn't know exactly what they were, like the jacks. I don't know how many times I've seen them and I've always wondered, what would you use this exactly for? And uh, it was great to see them used and how you use different parts that you would never expect to be used like the backhand and upside down. Really cool. Yes, yes. And, and those jacks have been tools that, you know, have been around again for 2000 years. Um, and it's, so, yeah, in South Jersey, where there's a, been a lot of glass, a, a huge culture of glass, you are going to find stuff like these tools, the jacks, the shears, the paddles, um, you know, much more common around, um, you know, because of, of the amount of glass. And apparently the, the dogs are very excited, too. Um, so yeah, it is, and you know, it's amazing what they can make with that limited number of tools. You saw they basically use pipes, blocks, um, jacks, and paddles, and they created a whole lily pad pitcher. And um, so yeah, it's really exciting to see how they can, um, you know, and use these tools because you can't touch the glass with your hands, unlike something like ceramics where you are definitely hands-on. So to have those tools be an extension of their hands um, to be able to manipulate the materials. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when I was watching it, how to be that close to something that hot and then just to have that tool in between you, but to have the dexterity and like you said, that thought process to be thinking well ahead of what you have to do now. So the next thing you're going to do is able to work was uh, really, really cool. And I greatly appreciate it. Uh, yeah. yeah. See that in person. Absolutely. Um, we have. We, I know there was around 30 people that were watching. So uh, I know there's some folks out there. Uh, there is that 30 second delay, so sometimes it takes them a little while to call in. So we'll hold for a couple minutes in case there is someone who wants to call in. And uh, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed the history and I really enjoyed, like I said, that that live in person, uh, you know, just to be able to see them build the, the, the pit, lily pad picture right there uh, was really, really cool. Yeah, thank you. It is, um, again, it is very cool and I can't wait till. Uh... We can get back to being open um, so that people can come in and see that, see that in person. I, you know, I have faith we will get there, um, you know, sooner than we know it. Um, and we'll be able to share that um, with everybody again, because um, it is, it is absolutely amazing. And the skills that they have and just the, um, you know, just the knowledge that they have on how to do it. And each glass blower that I've talked to and worked with, they have a slightly different approach. You know, some people, really look at the color of the glass to understand uh, what stage it's in. Others can really feel it on the pipe, how that glass is moving at the end. Others count. They sort of have a, a beat that they, a rhythm that they work to that help them understand um, how long to, you know, work with it, how long to heat it. Um, so everyone, it's really interesting because um, science is still working out what glass is exactly. Um, but humans have known how to use it um, you know, for a very long time. So it's a, it's a really interesting uh, look at knowledge and different ways of, of knowing um, and how you can understand a material um, sort of, you know, through your body and not necessarily through, you know, scientific uh, understanding of molecular structure, so to speak. So it's, uh, yeah, it's an amazing skill. Um, and one that I know, I, you know, again, all the glass blowers I've talked to, you know, they're very honored to know that they are working with something that is an ancient technology and um, that they're sort of sharing that, that same motion and movement um, 
that a glass blower, say in you know the 1820s, would have been doing when making a lily pad pitcher. That that's, that's the same movements that Skitch was making. So it's a it's a really amazing again connection across across the across time and connects that past to the present and then you know to the future of where how we can manipulate the medium and what else we can uh, do with it to express ourselves. You know, one of the neat aspects I thought too was particularly in South Jersey, once the commercial aspect uh, started to go away a little bit where the artists themselves, the glassmakers continue <laughs> doing it on their own to, like I said, to keep their skills alive, to, to keep it going. And that was, you know, really neat that they did that to enable those, uh, you know, to be passed along. And uh, that's just another reflection of what you're saying of that connection to the past. Absolutely. And, um, you know, because when we get to into the 60s and 70s, um, especially led by, I mentioned Dale Chihuly, um, there started being programs in art schools. Um, you know, RISD started their program, et cetera, so that you could go to art school and learn to blow glass from the fine arts point of view. But you do have that gap in between the 1920s and the 1960s, where again, these hand shops and these backyard shops are really helping to maintain this tradition in, in America, um, you know, before the artists were able to pick up those skills and learn these traditions and again, take off um, and use glass to make any number of amazing um, sculptures and installations and pieces. Awesome, very, very informative. Uh... If you want, uh, maybe just flash back to your email. And if anyone does have a question, uh, please feel free to email Chris, Christian or you can email me at the commission and I will forward the information or the question. And, Absolutely. Uh, uh, thanks again, great job. And it was really neat to see, you know, we hear so much about South Jersey and the sand and the glass, but it was really interesting to see all those pieces of the puzzle come together and then topped off with actually watching a, a, a lily pad picture being made, which is so synonymous with you know, Southern New Jersey, and uh, it's the combination of the ecosystem, the tradition, the culture of the people that ended up here all come together to, you know, have a really neat view into, uh, you know, artwork, which was very practical, but in some ways is just, you know, part of the brain to, to make it happen for us. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I enjoyed it. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. We'll see you out there.